so today on the Sound Iron Podcast, we have Jameson Nathan Jones, great middle name, by the way. Uh, and this guy is a <laughs> neoclassical you. composer. He's a pianist. I've seen some organ playing. Uh, he's a synth, and it says breakfast food enthusiast. So Jameson, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, man. We're thrilled to have you. Yeah. Thanks, man. Really glad to be here. Uh, really cool setup you guys have got. I've watched several episodes now. Great stuff. Oh, awesome. Uh, so if you had a full breakfast spread of your favorite food, what, what's, what's on there? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, it depends on whether you want to go the sweet or the savory route. So like, mm -hmm. obviously like an, a good omelet with bacon okay, nice. is, like is a classic. So that's pro probably the better choice than going straight like pancakes and yeah. crepes, which I also like. But I've been known to eat any of those variety of things at any time of the day. So it is not breakfast exclusive. Breakfast for uh, dinner. I okay. do not. Yeah. I'm in cl an inclusive breakfast aficionado. <laughs> Dude, I'm all about it. I I would eat breakfast anytime, midnight. Oh, yeah, in the morning, totally. And, all and of it. <laughs> being here, still living and being from the South, uh, biscuits. I don't know if you guys. Yeah. Like, I, I have friends in the UK who are like biscuits, which is totally different. A right, totally different, thing different thing over there. food. Yeah. Um, and they're like, what are you talking about? And it's like cake, basically. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's right. cake that we have that is acceptable to have for breakfast. Is Absolutely. So. Um, talk to me about your organ chops. I, I see you playing the organ and you got your feet going. And I'm like, this is not a normal synth fiddler, right? Like, uh, he's not just playing with one hand and riding the model. You got like actual skills. So uh, where'd you learn piano and organ? Well, I started uh, piano lessons when I was eight okay, uh, and kind of came all the way up through the classical route uh, with all of that and, and got two degrees in piano performance, actually. Okay. Uh, somewhere Crazy. around the age of like 15, I got re really interested in the pipe organ. Um, actually, it's kind of backtracking just a bit. My dad, uh, who was also a musician, introduced me to progressive rock like and and yes was my favorite of those love it and there's a, a particular yes album that they recorded it's called going for the one that they recorded in switzerland uh in a church okay and rick wakeman like the pipe organ is heavily featured on on a couple of the tracks on that album and i was like what is this thing that's like blowing this rock band out of the water it's like so big of course being a teenage boy at the time i was fascinated by how loud it was mm -hmm. um so yeah that was kind of my the start of my interest in the organ and from there of course i began to realize that you know there was a whole lot of repertoire for the organ uh, and being in the classical world already i just kind of leaned into that direction and sort of studied that parallel to my piano you know, so I kind of treated them as equal. Um, yeah. My primary job right now is I'm still a, the organist at a church. Okay. And uh, and that's my, yeah, my full-time gig. Um, oh, nice. So, yeah, it's only the organ is the only thing that we use for the service. And uh, so, like, I can't take vacations. It's the only bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no band to back me up. Right. But, uh, yeah, so I'm playing like classical rep still uh, every week, which I like because it keeps my chops up, but I, I don't like because it takes a lot of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a it's use it or lose it skill for sure. It is not riding a bicycle. <laughs> not even close. Yeah. Right. So how, how do you how do you practice? Like, do you go there and like, you know, for like a, a couple hours before and just kind of get everything warmed up or? Yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's easier now having a, a job where I have access to the organ and a key whenever I mm -hmm. want. But when I was a student, I would have to like find churches because that's where most organs are. Yeah. You can't um, just take those <laughs> to the gig. It's like, you got to yeah. go to the gig to play it. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And you know, it's kind of similar to the piano in that way. That, it, that's something as pianists we have to figure out is like adapting to the instrument. You mm -hmm. know, when we go play for a, like a recital at some other place or a competition or something, it, we have no idea really what's going to mm -hmm. be there waiting for us as far as the instrument. So you have to kind of learn to quickly adapt uh, with, with the organ. It, it's more challenging because there's more variables and more options. Like there can be all different shapes and sizes uh, of organs basically. So mm -hmm. you kind of get a feel for how to adapt uh, in addition to just kind of the, the general technique of the instrument. 
uh, anyway, because you have to, like, it's one of the hardest things about the organ is people always think, well, like playing with your feet, that's, mm -hmm. and that is hard. It, it took a while. Uh, but I think one of the more difficult things is the fact that the organ is not touch sensitive in any way. So it's like on and off, you know, for mm -hmm. the notes. Yeah. So the only way you have to be expressive is either if part of the organ is enclosed, in other words, behind shutters, which if you see like those pedals in the middle that look like expression pedals, mm -hmm. that's what they're for is to open and close the shutters. Oh, okay. And the other, the other way is to like change registrations, which is the combination of stops. So mm -hmm. like obviously stops are in a different place on every organ. There's kind of a general layout where you kind of know where things are, mm -hmm. but it's, you have to get a feel for that really quickly. So yeah, when someone comes in to do a recital or something, they want to spend a day or two probably with the organ, at least several hours, you know, yeah. uh, just to kind of get a feel for each one. And do you like label things or, and do you think of it as like adding or removing colors or how, like what's the brain process there? It's similar to that. It's kind of like orchest orchestration in a way. Um, and I think it kind of helped me out when I got into synthesis and sound design a little bit because like you learn certain combinations in general of what certain stops sound like. Every organ is different, of course, as we just talked about, but you kind of learn general things like this will probably work or this probably won't sound good, right? Mm. Um, general conventions. But then at the same time, you like my teachers fortunately taught me like always use your ears first and foremost. It's like, yeah. listen, and does it sound, does it sound good? You might need to do something less conventional on this organ because it's different than what you're used to. So yeah, I think that was kind of a valuable experience and not really something we think about at the piano because we kind of have one option. Yeah, <laughs> A piano generally sounds like a piano, so. We, uh, Sound Iron loves organs. Like we can't get enough organs. Uh, Mike and Greg, the uh, two of the co-founders, they're just like, oh, another organ? Yeah, we'll take it, let's sample it. And then uh, pipe organs, we have like three or four pipe organs. We got more in the works. And uh, nice. I'm just like, guys, I I'm pretty sure we've got enough organs. And they're like, no, it's impossible <laughs> to have too many. Yeah. So Every just, organ is different. Yeah, theater totally. organs yeah. and uh, vintage keys, like synth organs. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot of history. With a big pipe, like a big pipe organ like that, like the space that it's sitting in is so much a part of the characteristics of mm -hmm. the organ. So you could have... If it were possible, which it's not because they're a part of the building, <laughs> but if it were possible to take like the organ that I play every week and put it in a different space, it would totally change mm -hmm. the way it sounds. Yeah. You know? So yeah, it's such, we, we also, we organist, it sounds like an exclusive club, but yeah, it's it really just a, yeah, it kind of really, is <laughs> really just a bunch of, uh, a bunch of geeks. <laughs> uh, we like to say that like the best stop on an organ is the room that it's in, mm. you know, which is absolutely true because you need that because it like the sound just starts and stops. So if you're in a really dry space, it's really hard mm -hmm. to make the organ sound good because you need that yeah. buffer, you know, to kind of fill things out. So, and then at the same time, if it's super wet, you have to compensate for that because you can't play quite as legato. You need to add detachment in there so that it's you can actually hear the notes, you know, <laughs> mm, <laughs> like yeah. that little thing, like being able to hear all the notes. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating um, kind of as an instrument. And unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people playing mm -hmm. it these days, which is a hard instrument to play. So it right. makes sense. But um, yeah, it's a fascinating thing, fascinating piece of technology that's been around so long. It's kind of incredible. Yeah, playing piano is already hard enough. Like <laughs> just just having like you know two hands going off, and then it's like adding like another one. It's like you got to split your brain like three different ways. Yeah, it really does. Adding in that one extra element took several months for me before. Like my left hand and my feet would always try to double. Mm. Weirdly, it's like my brain was connecting the two all the time. Yeah. So breaking that into like something, it's probably not totally dissimilar to a drummer, mm -hmm. like being able to do something totally independent with your feet. Um, yeah, it's just something that takes time. So can you talk about the transition from like very classical, very technical focus to synthesis, electronic music? Yeah, well, it probably goes back to, um, again, I referenced my dad getting me into like progressive rock. So that yeah. was probably my first, you know, those guys were, were doing stuff like Keith Emerson and Rick Wakeman were doing stuff with uh, with synthesizers way back in the day. 
so that was the introduction for sure that was like oh well these things can make cool sounds too and of course at the time i was only interested in playing as fast as possible on them <laughs> right and then later on <laughs> then later on i realized like oh like as tools for sound design this is really powerful and something that i haven't experienced uh, in any other way musically but ultimately i think as i was finishing up my piano degree i had the incredible opportunity to start studying composition with uh, uh, an incredible composer who happens to be in my area uh, as composer in residence uh, named Luigi Zaninelli, who studied uh, at the Curtis Institute with uh, Giancarlo Minotti and uh, was, you know, <laughs> knew Samuel Barber up there. Um, wow. If you're familiar with like the Adagio for Strings, one of the greatest pieces of music ever written, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so having that connection of someone who kind of walked and talked among those people and was himself an incredible composer, um, opened my eyes up to um, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about now, which is like composition and that process. And ultimately that got me wanting to get into film scoring as I think everyone does at some point who likes music mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> yeah, um, I had no idea how one could do such a thing like how does that how does someone even make that kind of music like i knew a computer was involved but i didn't know what that meant had no idea what a daw mm -hmm. was and this was like we're talking like maybe 11 years ago at this point so not that long ago right i was just sure. so yeah. immersed in like the classical world and like just writing art music with uh, pencil and staff paper so like um outside of sibelius and finale i didn't know how to make music with computers but I started thinking, well, if I'm going to actually do this and get into film composing and, and, and do any of that kind of work at all, I need to learn how people are making that kind of music. Yeah. So I just kind of totally immersed myself in trying to figure out like sample libraries like you guys make and like, oh, well, this is really cool. You know, kind of the process that I think everyone goes through. It's like being enamored then with the tools that we actually all have at this mm -hmm. point, which are incredible. Somewhere along the line, um, I had totally planned to move to LA, like, you know, sell all my possessions and just go out there, made a couple trips out there. And at some point, uh, it dawned on me that I didn't know anybody out there. And I could, in fact, you know, spend all my money to move out there um, and just do all of the stuff that I would could also do here, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, where yeah. I'm from, uh, which was just start getting better at making music that way and figure out like what is my artistic voice if i have one uh, in that world so that's kind of where my focus turned to and where it has kind of remained uh, ever since and even in that time since i sort of shifted well i saw like i at some point got introduced to olafur arnold's uh, was the first guy that i saw in like the neoclassical uh, modern classical scene and i noticed that oh he's doing film scores but it's not because he set out to do film scores. He's actually just making the music that he likes, putting it out there. And I didn't know that he had like major yeah. label support at the time. Obviously he didn't at one point, but like, he's just doing what he wants to do. And that directors are coming to him because, you know, um, mm. they want his sound. And that was like the light yeah. bulb moment for me. It's like, there's another way to approach this than trying to be able to do everything everyone else is doing to specializing on my own sound and what is that and figuring that out mm -hmm. and that has kind of worked so i started just focusing on becoming an artist and trying to figure out what is my voice and how can i do that to the best of my ability and learning as i go so yeah that's that's really what led me and of course you know he was using synthesizers in a different way and that got me off and then i started watching like the sonic state podcast and like just wanted to get every synthesizer possible um, <laughs> so yeah, I kind of, I kind of went off the deep end. I, I don't know if you've noticed, I, I guess I tend to be a bit obsessive compulsive when I'm introduced to something new and it's like, okay, I got to go all in on that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that has both served me well in some instances and at some other instances, it's like, okay, I got to pump the brakes here because I'm like too far down the rabbit hole. So it's kind of how I ended up here with a lot of synthesizers. <laughs> Yeah, Craig and I are the same way with like phases we go through. Like mm -hmm. every every couple months, Craig will be like, "I gotta change the studio around. I gotta move everything. Yeah. I gotta buy this new toy." Or like I'll be obsessed with a camera or whatever, and uh, it's it's normal human behavior. Yeah, yeah, I think I think 
I think uh, people like us, it, it's kind of a it's a good thing to be able to get into that obsessive mind state because it it really helps you with getting good at something or learning something fast. Because when you're just thinking about it all the time, or just really wanting to explore it, you know, as deep as as deep as you can go, it it's it's good. It it can be like a curse in a way because it's like it's easy to like just completely just go on a different road and like forget what you're like really like like the thing that's really moving the needle it's like i, I mean I, I need to do that but i i really want to do this and it's like sometimes it's a oh, it's a blessing and a curse i guess <laughs> yeah totally and and that can be fun too it's like and that's oddly kind of what happened it's like i i'm not even sure at this point that i totally want to do film scoring mm -hmm. anymore I, it's kind of, i've kind of shifted away from that now that other opportunities have presented themselves it's like after having done a few film scores, it's like, oh, this is actually different than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of jobs that you have to take early on just to kind of prove your chops are not necessarily the kind of things that you want to devote months and months of your life exclusively to doing. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it takes. So, um, yeah. So sometimes like you get so far down the rabbit hole that, that you find other rabbit holes <laughs> that, are, yeah. that can be fun to kind of explore too. So yeah, totally. Yeah. Who are some of your favorite film composers? Like if you had to pick five. Gosh, I love, I love like the old school guys like Bernard Herrmann. Mm -hmm. um, I think Jerry Goldsmith, you know, all of the ones that you would probably think of. Obviously, John Williams. Uh, every, everybody knows, uh, you know, that one. Yeah. Um, James Horner, all of those, those big names. As far as people who are doing it now, and it's, uh, it's funny because... He's maybe one of the reasons, even though he's not maybe, I don't know how old he is, actually. Uh, Bear McCreary, mm -hmm. um, who did Battlestar Galactica. Oh, yeah. I'm a big fan of him. That series was a big part of my interest in wanting to get into film scoring. The things that he was doing that I was kind of groundbreaking for television. Now it's not uncommon for TV shows to be, you know, better than films <laughs> in a lot of respects are deeper mm -hmm. and, you know, have high quality scores. But back then it was like, that was not where you went to, to listen to incredible scores. Um, but yeah, that, that series and the types of sounds, like he used a lot of uh, world instruments in that score and like, but through distortions and like mm -hmm. blown out through amps and stuff, had no idea what it was at the time. And that was one of those, one of those scores that was like, how is he doing this? And how can I do it too? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, later on, you know, video game scores, like the Halo soundtrack, you know, all of the, the classics that like probably guys our age grew up with. Um, Mass mm -hmm. Effect was another series that's like had a lot of synthesizers in it. Right. And I was like, wow, this is, yeah. this is, these are sounds that I'm not familiar with, you know? And I was intrigued by all of that. So there's a lot of, a lot of, different influences uh scattered about that's the cool thing about um when you're getting into like working in a daw is that then you can start like combining all kinds of stuff like orchestral stuff with synths or doing all kinds of weird stuff and that was the thing that i found like when i was first getting into that that was really interesting was like like just taking a midi track and just putting it on a synth like oh like 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 you mentioned prog like progressive rock and stuff like i'm a i'm a big fan of like dream theater and like those kinds of bands mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, having a guitar solo and then taking the MIDI and like putting it on a synth and doubling it like, wow, it's like, you know, you have all these options like right at your fingertips. It's really cool. Yeah. And then like different synthesizers, of course, can do different things. And just the way they distribute voices differently and things like that. It's like that's a great that's a great trick for for coming up with new things is like writing something on one synth uh, mm -hmm. and then putting it through another and just seeing how it translates. Um, in fact, some I just read. Uh, a YouTube comment, which I've been trying to do less of lately. <laughs> as, as videos have been getting more views, the comments also get interesting. But that's another oh, yeah. topic. Um, but uh, someone had mentioned, I, I mentioned in a recent video about, um, it was more about making your own patches and uh, how you can reverse engineer presets and learn things that way. Um, and someone commented uh, that they would actually port or recreate patches on different synthesizers uh, just to kind of, mm. you know, see what it would sound like with that synth's specific limitations. And mm. that was fascinating. And that was one of those where it's like, I'm glad I still read some comments because, you know, that's, that's a great idea that I had not really 
considered in that way before. So yeah, kind of going to what you were saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The comment section is an interesting thing. Like we always joke about like, you know, you'll see like really good comments and then you'll just see some that are just like, why would you take the time out of your day to, to say certain things? It's just like, yeah, blows my mind, but it's entertaining. You just got to <laughs> learn to just brush it off or just not don't even care about it. I always say uh, we have a get off our lawn mentality on the sound iron YouTube. So I'm, uh, we're pretty quick to trash comments. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them. I'll be like, hey, check this out. And we'll just kind of laugh and then bye. That's it. It's gone. <laughs> you know who loves my YouTube comments that are just like lately I've been fortunate enough to get a couple videos that have kind of popped off in a way others have not in the past for me. And what has come with that is like YouTube's algorithm showing it to people that don't care, don't know who I am, mm -hmm. uh, have some sort of emotional reaction to the title and thumbnail, which is another another topic entirely, mm -hmm. uh, which really just means that I've learned how to make titles and thumbnails better, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they're working. But they like, I'll, I'll screenshot it and then just, I won't reply. I'll just share it to my Instagram story. And like the people on Instagram have been following me closer for longer. And it's like, mm -hmm. we all just laugh about it. It's just hilarious. You've got your, uh, your always, own inside joke. You always, you always blur out the name, though, because no free shout outs. For those yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, one of your more popular videos was Classical Musicians Suck at Electronic Music. And uh, the title is kind of like grabby. But uh, I think yeah. you made some great points. I got a classical music degree. I mean, I definitely saw that where you're focused so much on technique and so much on playing the greats and like you are nothing, you are worthless. You are an 18, 19 year old and you don't know anything about music and don't, don't write your own stuff, like learn these massive composers. And then like you get out of college and you're set free and you still feel inferior and it's like hard to create original feeling music yeah and that was i think that's the experience for a lot of people and i think it's why i've kind of moved away from the classical scene you know to a large degree there's just such a it's so weird because like they wonder where their audience is going but they sure. they actively try to drive them away as quickly as possible you know it's it, that's just my experience you mm -hmm. know i can't speak speak for everyone there are incredible people teachers that i've had and stuff i would never trade my background for anything it taught me so many things but at the same time yeah it's so easy to get caught up in like the uh the elitism of mm -hmm. it all and like it's just such snobbery you know that i that really was off-putting to me as someone who did have an interest in things that were a little outside of that realm. And yeah. even still, um, like talking to former teachers and stuff, uh, you know, I almost don't even bring up like what I'm actually doing now because it's, you can just see their eyes sort of glaze over and like, they don't understand because they don't, they aren't even aware, you know, of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it takes, which I, I also get because it takes an incredible amount of uh, focus and work to make it in that scene that people maybe on the outside don't realize like how much of their lives these people have devoted to this. It's, it's not really dissimilar to like a professional athlete or something, mm -hmm. uh, except the pay is much different. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's much um, worse. But as far as the competitiveness and just the amount of the entire, your entire life, you know, to that point has been largely devoted to that one thing, you know, and I think that's why the sort of tunnel vision happens in that mm -hmm. world so easily. Um, but it's something that I don't really want to live in, you know, so I'll visit from time to time, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't want to stay in that world. Um, but yeah, just speaking specifically to that video, which I think was your question that I'll attempt to answer now. Um, I struggled with what to call that video because I have a problem, I guess, with what I would consider clickbait, or I did. But then I also am starting to understand how YouTube works. Mm -hmm. And to make the kind of videos that I'm making now, it was no problem. It was very easy when I was just making tutorials or demos. It's like it kind of writes itself, you know. Um, but when you're doing a video that's about um, an idea or is almost really what I think of them now is argumentative essays in which you can actually be arguing for or against your title. 
right? The title is just the headline that's there to kind of create a mm -hmm. reaction. And if, if no one sees or clicks on the video, they don't know how good your content is. Like if the video could be amazing, they're never going to see it. So I've sort of accepted, even though on a gut level, I don't like trying to be clickbaity, as you might call yeah. it. Yeah. But I've sort of accepted that if you're going to play the game, like that's how the platform works. And I have reframed it as like, okay, if I were writing an argumentative essay and it were published in some sort of publication, this would be the way I would be writing anyway. It's like, it's, it's a given that it's my opinion. And as long as the title is not directly misleading people, I feel like that's what you could call ethical clickbait. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, it's sure. like, of course it's, of course it's clickbait. That, that's the point. <laughs> yeah it's like you don't want to so, like have like a black thumbnail or you know or just like something that yeah. like you know has nothing it's like you want people to be interested just by seeing it because it's the same thing like when you're you know looking for something to watch on netflix you know that's why they have like uh thumbnails and stuff that just you know will be targeted toward like if you watch movies with certain types of characters or if you click on stuff that has a car more like they're they will find a scene from there that has a car in it like oh i'll click that you know so it's like just the way it works yeah it's it's kind of unfortunate but it's kind of the world we like we live in reality i am aware of that you know <laughs> so it's like that's the way things are yeah. and if i can the way i've started to think of it because that video is a great example like the first thing people commented was just um wendy carlos as if i had never heard of and they even mentioned, you know, like Rick Wakeman and Keith Emerson, which is so funny because that's like was my introduction mm -hmm. um, into kind of this world. But like those people, like they're, they're not interested in having a conversation. They're not there to watch the video. They're just literally clicking and, and leaving a, a comment, which is the easiest thing in the world to do. It turns out there's there's no barrier for resistance uh, yeah. <laughs> to leave an internet comment. I'm not sure if you guys were aware of that, but yeah. <laughs> um, there's no, yeah, there's no repercussions at all. Uh, for them. So if you take it like that, and you also think, even by way of them just clicking on it and commenting on it, it's going to show it to maybe 10,000 other people that will get something out of it. And that's exactly what happened. It's kind of, that's just how it works. You know, I wish it weren't totally that way, but it is, unfortunately. So if you're going to play the YouTube game, you have to, you have to kind of think about how you package an idea just as much as the content itself. Yeah. What what types of things have you found like the most results from like as far as like how you title stuff or or, or thumbnails? Is there like people that you've seen that you've kind of tried to like, oh, like that caught my eye. So like trying to do something similar or like certain things that you found that work better than others? I think the general thing that I've learned after doing it wrong for a, a many months <laughs> <laughs> is uh, trying to be clear rather than being clever with a thumbnail which sometimes those can intersect, but I see a lot of uh, people who make thumbnails that it's like, it's clear that this was an expression of their creative vision and that's fine. But if it's con so confusing that you don't even know what the video is about, then people aren't going to click on it. You know, mm. fewer elements and just more clarity, I think. And it, it obviously grabs the attention more. It's funny. I, I talked to, uh, to Cameron uh, a couple times, Venus theory, mm -hmm. um, who's got a much larger channel than I do, uh, but is also kind of doing these kinds of more thoughtful video essay type format things. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about how the way you frame it makes all the difference in whether someone's going to watch it because the video could be about five different things that could be possible titles or thumbnails, but like choosing the one that people that's going to click with people and resonate the most is, can be really challenging. So yeah, I think it is more difficult in this, with this, kind of video to like narrow down okay what is going to resonate with people the most but in general i would say be be clear over being clever with with the thumbnails and mm -hmm. the titles i like that so you did a video called trying to grow on youtube and it was or something like that and it was just all about like uh spending a year uh trying to growth hack a little bit and learning from people who are kind of higher up the ladder of youtube and then you and uh, I really liked that video. I passed it on to Craig. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked about like how the trend starts going up and then you plateau and you get discouraged. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had like similar situations with like composing music as well, but you've, you've had like 
uh, I want to say like 20,000 new subscribers over the last six months. So talk a little bit about that. And uh, I don't know if you feel like you're doing anything different or if you're just like being consistent and uh, the algorithm has smiled upon you. Yeah, I think it's maybe a combination of things because I did, like, I think when I put out that video, it was kind of the one year mark of me actually trying, you know, and it was just kind of an update. And I was, my goal was to get to, uh, I started out with about 3000 subscribers that I gotten just sort of organically from uploading whatever, you know, yeah. synth jams or whatever. And then after a, a year of really pushing hard and trying, but basically just everything was centered around synth reviews and like just showing how I make patches and sounds with stuff here in my studio and frankly being very bad at making videos uh, for a large portion of that. I got very close to 10,000, which was my kind of goal for the end of the year. I Just an arbitrary number, you know, sure. nice round number that I had set mm -hmm. for myself. So I was like, well, I'll just document like the experience because as someone who's trying to grow, I enjoy watching other people's experiences and like seeing, you know, kind of what their path has, has led them to. And um, <laughs> funny enough, I guess probably about a month after that, I did a slight pivot to talking more about the composition, compositional topics. And funny enough, what is more related to like my training and my background that I didn't really think anyone would care about um, because it was what I knew the most. And so it was like, well, everybody, it's like, why would anyone, like the, the stuff that I watch is about synthesizers. So that must be what people on YouTube want to watch. Not really realizing that like that was my unique thing was the background that I had had and now doing sure. stuff with synthesizers. So I think it, it took me at least a full year to figure out like what my own unique voice, I guess, as a YouTuber was, which uh, you mentioned um, similar to music, like finding your own artistic language and artistic voice and music can be similarly challenging. It was fascinating after I did make that slight shift. I had just crossed over the 10,000 subscriber uh, mark. I would say that was at the beginning of March. And then I did a video about like how I used my composition background to break out of like four bar loop things that we so often get into with like when we write with sequencers and and uh you know samples and all of those tools that we have uh, in the computer and from that time to now my channel is over over doubled you know uh in size yeah. so it was like okay well maybe i'm onto something there so i've been kind of leaning into that that style mm -hmm. of thing but you know I could look at it as, well, I just wasted a full year making videos when I could have been doing this the whole time. But I don't think that's the case at all. I think I had to get used to making videos and better at making videos over the course of that year. Mm -hmm. I think if I had tried to make that video that like the first one that did pop off for me a year earlier, it would have sucked and, and no one would have cared about it. So it's like I watch... I still occasionally, but I especially last year was watching a lot of like YouTube growth videos and stuff, like just trying to figure out how this, how the platform worked. And I would always hear them talk about like quantity first, just so that you get in the repetitions that you need to, to get good at anything, then shift to quality. And I've seen direct results from just that very thing. Like I will take longer on a video now if I don't feel like I've got even like the thumbnail and title right I'll take an extra couple of days just to kind of think about what would be a better way to approach this because I've found that getting that right doesn't just you know give your video a little boost it can like 10x yep the the, the results from that video so like taking the time once you kind of have things dialed in and have a process mm -hmm. um can, can really pay off in the long run uh, rather than just cranking it out just for the sake of putting out a video every week or something, which I still try to do, but like if something's not ready, I'm not gonna, gonna force it out into the world anymore. Yeah. Do you ever think about thumb, like thumbnails and titles before you actually do the videos or? Yeah, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to do that more. Um, a lot of times I'll have like a rough idea at least um, and I think that is a good idea. Like if you have a clear, because that kind of helps the whole video come into focus for you. Like if you have a clear vision of what the video is supposed to be, mm. the, the viewer is probably going to have a clear 
vision of what the video is and mm -hmm. before they even click on it, you know? And then everything after they click on it should reaffirm whatever they clicked on. So I think that's a great piece of advice um, to have those things in mind. You can always fiddle around with it later, you know? Mm -hmm. Though I, I try not to get <laughs> sucked into like constantly changing thumbnails and titles uh, after the fact too much. I have I have seen, like there's one video in particular that I just kind of adjusted things a little bit and it mm. like took off after that, so. All right. Yeah, it's weird how that works. <laughs> yeah, I think I've even seen uh, Cameron do that sometimes where like, you know, like, cause I subscribe to his YouTube channel and like he'll, he'll have like some, some title and like a certain picture, you know, for the thumbnail. And then the next time I was like, wait, I remember yeah, it looked different. Like was, I think it's yeah. because, I mean, he's definitely, you know, trying to, you know, do that whole thing. And it makes sense. I mean, cause he's, his channels, you know, really taken off over the years. And Cameron's like an analytics wizard. He's like, uh, he is all up into the analytics and, uh, he's really good at kind of fine tuning things and, and figuring out what will resonate with people the most. So it's one reason that I've, I've enjoyed being able to, to kind of pick his brain a little bit about things like that, because he's so, so much more experienced in, in that world than I am. You know, I certainly hope none of this comes across like I have it figured out totally. It's just like a couple of things have just started working. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to sort of, what's really been nice about it is uh, that it, it's not dependent on like getting a synthesizer at a certain time, like before it's released or something, mm -hmm. or like a certain effect that people are searching for. It's like the ideas that, or the videos that are resonating with people the most seem to be like just ideas that I'm coming up with because of my past experiences. And that, that's something that I feel like hopefully <laughs> is a well that won't run dry um, because like I'm constantly having new experiences just you know through the course of making the videos. And so if I can learn how to frame those experiences in a way that help other people, which was really um, kind of the shift in mindset that helped unlock things for me is like not just thinking of myself all the time, but like how can this information help others Hopefully that's something that I can keep coming back to and just continue to get better at doing. Yeah, those videos are much more evergreen than a new synth review as well. So that's definitely good. But uh, I think you're absolutely right about putting in the hours of suck, like just bad videos and getting those out. Yeah. Like I know some people talk about like you got to put out a hundred horrible videos. I think it's nice, Casey Neistat that talks about just like you got to put out a hundred videos and then come talk to me and like, we'll start doing analytics and start looking at other stuff. But like just getting, uh, getting all those clicks in and getting all those shots in and missing focus, the audio dropped out, all of those mistakes, you got to mm -hmm. just like swim through, wade through, and then you can actually start making progress. Yeah. I was talking to a friend funny enough, like now that I've, <laughs> Now that I've been doing like more stuff with Photoshop and everything, making YouTube uh, thumbnails and also like I've been making my own album art for a while now too. Cool. I, somehow I ended up like a really good friend of mine has me like working on his album art and like CD booklet, okay. which I'm happy to do. But I also was very honest with him. It's like, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, so just so you're aware. But we, we also, that got us off on the on the subject of like, just getting comfortable being uncomfortable yeah. with things mm. and, and learning and, and someone actually in my community also just mentioned um, that like the blank page fright that you get when you're just looking at your DAW or a sheet of paper and there's nothing on it and you don't even know where to start. That is never not terrifying. <laughs> it's like that is always going to scare all of us, I think. Mm -hmm. But you learn what that feeling feels like and you know that it's part of the process of getting where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So it's like even setting up for a video was too much resistance for me early on to actually do anything. So it was like, oh, I don't want to have to move a camera and a light. It's like, that's not that hard. If I would just do it and get used to doing it, then it would just be part of the process. And that's exactly what happened after several months of doing videos. So it's like, there are so many points at which are kind of sticking points for us all, I think, mm -hmm. that if we get used to pushing through, it's like, well, this is actually not so bad. 
if I would just do it and stop putting it off, you know. Um, but that's just a that's a human thing. We like to be very comfortable, and anything yeah. that kind of takes us out of that is there's going to be resistance. Yeah, it, it makes me think of that. Uh, I remember seeing this Tony Robbins thing a while back where he was talking to this woman and she was like, you know, I want to lose weight, but I don't have time. And he was just, you know, you know, talking to her and she was basically saying like, well, first I got to get up and then I got to go into my car and then I got to take my kids to this, you know, I got to like you, it's easy to break down the entire process and and find a million reasons to not do something versus just doing it. And, you know, it's just like anything, like do something, you know, for even like 30 days, then a nice consistent habit and then you don't really it's not that much of a big deal anymore it's just kind of you have to force yourself to do things even if you don't want to but then eventually yeah like you said it's not it's not that bad you just gotta do it how do you typically start a composition and like where do you get the uh initial idea for a composition you're talking about the blank page so you're sitting at the blank page or the blank daw uh where, where are you starting it very much depends on the project. Um, and I think I talked about this a little bit in that, that video we were talking about earlier about kind of the challenges from coming from the classical world into electronic music, because so many of the tools that we have can delect directly uh, sort of lead to inspiration and kind of generating a spark for you, which I love, I really do. But at the same time, there's still something about just sitting down at the piano with some staff paper, um, I guess because that's like what my background is. I'm mm -hmm. very comfortable doing that. And nothing I've found is faster than like just writing things out by hand and, and being able to kind of scribble over things very quickly and, and workshop ideas. So I was actually just working on a collaboration uh, the other day that is electronic but I just started out with like the core ideas, just kind of scribbling them down on some staff paper uh, rather than going straight to the doll. It doesn't always happen that way, but I've found that my best ideas tend to tend to come out that way because I, I'm just more willing to, to change things and move things around and really like the process of actually taking the time to write it down is almost like a, a real time editing process where instead of like trying to always go back and fix that, if I just get the core idea right the first time, or at least, hmm. you know, the first draft of the core idea is something I can build off of, then generally I can build everything around that or off of that. So I still love working that way. Um, obviously I still write for solo piano a lot because I just love doing that. And it can be kind of like a palate cleanser for me where I, you know, Sound design is wonderful and I love that too, but sometimes it's nice to have those decisions already be made for you and just focus on the melodic and harmonic ideas. Mm. And then other times it just starts with sound design. Like if I, if a sound, like I love tape looping and like um, a lot of my music is more ambient. So like coming up with a patch that sort of transports me to some other place. And then I often end up improvising around that or over the top of that. It's just to kind of get some rough ideas is also has been really kind of fruitful for me too. But they're two very different mindsets and like balancing those two things has always been something that I feel like I'm leaning too heavily on one or the other, but I've also kind of accepted that it's okay just to work in those two different worlds, you know, uh, both have their, their different challenges. Yeah. In one of your videos, you said creativity is a muscle and the more you use it, the, the stronger it gets and it gets easier to use it and easier to flex that creativity. And, uh, I love muscles. So I thought that was a great <laughs> analogy. <laughs> I love muscle. You, that should be on a t-shirt. You should yeah. be wearing that right now. I hope, I, I hope, uh, <laughs> we, we can get that for a sound iron. Um, okay. I got a couple more questions for you and then, uh, we'll move to the rapid fire section. But, uh, the, if you're a beginner and you're wanting to get into synthesis uh, you only have a laptop. What would you recommend as like a first soft synth? Oh gosh. Um, well, I'm probably not up to date on all of the software stuff because I've been like getting into hardware synths so heavily lately, but, um, I did a little basics of, uh, synthesis course nice. recently and I just used vital for one of the, and not even really being aware of it because I thought that would be an interesting place to teach from is like 
here's a scent that I don't know, but we're going to figure out together how it works. And uh, I was really impressed uh, with that free tool. And it's kind of mind blowing to me uh, at this point that, that all of those tools are free or a lot of those tools are free. Um, I love yeah, idle. That, yeah. That's a great one. Um, I, I recently got pigments and phase plant and they're both incredible. Phase plant is like modular playground. It's yep. really, really powerful. And as a modular guy myself, I, I tend to really like being able to build stuff from the ground up for more experimental stuff. I don't really know what you couldn't do with the combination of phase plant and pigments. Those two are incredible. Nice. So your first hardware synth for a beginner, if, if they're just itching to, to tweak real knobs, what's a, what's a synth that is under $1,000 that you'd be like, yeah, you should start here? There's so many great options now of really affordable synths. I will say, I won't say too much about this because this is like a, a firestorm on the synth internet uh, to say anything about <laughs> Behringer one way or the other. But I will say <laughs> they sound really good. They sound really good. I don't really like them as a company. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, my yeah. first synth was a Korg MS-20 Mini. Um, nice. Which was incredible. And I actually sold not that long ago. And then Tony Anderson accused me of being a murderer because I had sold my first synthesizer. Said that I might have some real psychological <laughs> issues. And he may be right. <laughs> I, I don't know that that's an ina inaccurate uh, statement to make, but... The jury's still out. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, who am I to say, really? That's a great one because it's semi-modular if you want to get into, like, patching. And it is, I believe the Mini is still, it's, it's like 500, something like that. Um, mm. I'm trying to think. The the Korg Mini Log, I've heard incredible things about as a first polysynth. It's only four voices, but that can at least kind of get you started. And it's got a, a small footprint. I believe under 500 or around 500 as well. Um, love the sound of it. Um, I think the XD even has maybe a, like a wavetable oscillator or something. I don't own that one, but I've heard good things about it. And these are new prices, which nobody's buying new, right? We're buying on Reverb or eBay or whatever. Totally. Yeah, it's look for deals would be my advice. It's good advice. Since... Uh, the music making is not the most lucrative opportunity. You gotta, you gotta cut costs where it it's counts. It's ground, groundbreaking advice. Look for deals. <laughs> if you take anything away from <laughs> this yeah, podcast, pay yeah. less, pay less money for things. Would be my <laughs> advice in general. Too. Yeah, especially when you get into that world, because it's like it's like getting into like buying boutique any you know, like boutique guitars or something. It's like you can get very expensive very quickly. So it's like you gotta be you gotta be smart in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I will say because. People, and I'm sure it's this way in every music community that's gear, gear centric, um, but like the synth community, I've noticed a lot of people get so into the gear. And I, I actually just told someone this morning, as a matter of fact, like a new synth is not going to make you better at music. Like it, it may give you some different sounds, but if you don't even know how to use it, really, if you've just seen somebody use it and you liked what they did with it, that doesn't mean that you're going to like it or be able to get those sounds out of it so i don't really like it's one reason that i am trying to kind of forge my own path on youtube and not just be a synth fluencer which is a word that i hate <laughs> that people call themselves apparently i think it sets a bad precedent that like i i had the same thought too coming up it's like i need that thing because that's what olafur arnold's used mm -hmm. so so i wanted a juno because i saw him using one and then I was like, well, actually, maybe I don't want to, not that I have anything against them, but like maybe I want something with more modulation capabilities than a Juno because it's very limited, uh, which can be a good thing too. So it's like, but I didn't even know what's the point. It's like, I just saw him use it and was like, that's, I need one of those, right? So that's a dangerous thing. And as people who do have influence, I guess, over, you know, people who are watching, um, I think you have to be responsible about not just pushing the, the newest thing that you might be sponsored by or not. There's nothing wrong with sponsorships, but like it can create this kind of consumerism, you know, mm -hmm. outlook on everything that people are always chasing the next best thing. And that's actually counterproductive most of the time to them actually getting better at what they already have. And, and so that's, 
kind of the way that I would like to be able to teach people to use what they already have um, uh, rather than just always chase whatever else is out there. The next new thing. Yeah, I think it's easy to procrastinate and think that you need to buy something when you're trying to get good at something. Like, I don't know, you know, how, how you are today. Like, I, I feel like, like for me, like as time goes on, I almost like don't want anything else. Cause I feel like it's just like, I just see it as space on my hard drive that is just going to be taken up. And it's like, I'm probably not even going to use it or it's like easy to get plugins and like, forget what you got just because it's like, you see this new thing. Oh, I need to get that. And, um, yeah, like nowadays I'm just like, no, I don't even want it. Like I got to really, really want it or think about it for a while. Like if I still want it down the road, like, all right, yeah, I, I probably should get that or something like, cause it's very easy to like, oh, I want to get like new studio monitors or the new this or whatever. And it's like, do I need it really? Like you got to ask yourself that <laughs> usually the, an the answer is probably no, but <laughs> I checked out your Instagram and your audio quality is really, really good. So I wanted to ask you how you're doing that. You're not just uh, recording stuff with your iPhone mic. No, I, uh, I guess about two or three years ago, I started kind of similar to what I did on YouTube. I started actually trying uh, to, to grow on Instagram a little bit. Um, around the time that it became clear to me that like Spotify was not the end all be all to like, I know there are a lot of artists that have a lot of monthly listeners on Spotify and no fans. Mm. Uh, it's just the way it is um, because it's so playlist focused and you've got to build a following outside of that. Yeah. You know? Because you never know when you're going to be taken off of a playlist. It's happened to me. Like, I did have some luck getting on editorials early, but then I did a little shift and started using synthesizers and distortions. <laughs> and uh, it was like, nope, we don't want that on the playlist so much. So, yeah, yeah I, I typically, I, um, I just shoot the Instagram videos. Um, well, it's basically the short versions of what I was, uh, what I was doing on YouTube early on, where it's just like, one-on-one -on -one with a synth. So it's basically the Instagram stuff is like cut up versions of the early YouTube synth jam stuff. So I would just record it like with a good camera and then I would chop it up into little bits um, and just upload that to Instagram, which turned out to be really good because I now have a lot of B-roll for my YouTube channel. Nice. <laughs> That's like really high quality. So I was kind of looking out for my future self there and had no idea, but, um, but yeah, so that's, Typically, yeah, the audio is done, you know, through the DAW or whatever. Like while I'm recording the video, I just sync it up and required a little tiny bit of editing, but nothing like, you know, YouTube editing. So mm -hmm. nice. Nice. All right. So we will move right on to these uh, three rapid fire questions at the end here. Uh, the first one is best recent purchase under a hundred dollars. Under a hundred dollars. I would have to say, and you can't see them because one of them is holding up the camera that I'm using <laughs> right now, but the, the little quick release clips um, yes. for my cameras, I should have probably looked in, to see what manufacturer they were. Uh, but there's also one like up there holding up my overhead cam. But it's funny, I felt like they were too expensive so i didn't buy them for a long time but what's hilarious is they were like 25 bucks oh, wow. <laughs> and i was like 25 bucks it's, it's like this big and it's just like a holds a camera right and at the same time i'll see a synthesizer that's like a lot more than 25 bucks and be like oh that's a good deal i'm gonna buy that <laughs> so at some point i was like i think there might be something wrong with me um, <laughs> uh, so yeah i just bit the bullet and shelled out, you know, 50 bucks for a couple of quick release clips. And it's so nice because now I can like move them to any stand, like just instantly without having to unscrew. Very simple, easy life hack that has made my life much easier. And once again, kind of relating back to what we talked about, removing one layer of resistance mm -hmm. to like setting up for a video, um, which when you, when you figure out how much time editing takes, you're trying to cut down anywhere else you can. So... Um, yeah, big time saver. Perfect. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta find out which ones you're using. Cause, uh, yeah, I could, I could benefit from that. I got uh, a few cameras that I use for yeah. doing the sound iron stuff. And yeah. And like when you want to like switch stuff around, it's kind of like always a little bit of a pain. So yeah, you got to tell me which ones. Yeah. You're there's like, using. 
Yeah, I had like 20 different adapters before, and it was always I always the wrong one was set up for what I needed at the time. So it's like mm -hmm. just kind of standardizing things a little bit yeah. really helps. What are you using for your, got, for your overhead? If you've got $25, it is <laughs> it's pretty steep. Right. Yeah. Uh, the overhead is just a it's a big tripod. You can you can see like one leg of it right there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big tripod with just like a, a vertical boom. Oh, okay. Um, that juts out over over that table back there, and that's where I filmed the overhead stuff, which is a little bit of a pain. I tried to set up something here at my main desk, which is right in front of me, but it's just too cluttered here, mm. and I needed just like a full table when, I, especially when I was doing, and when I still occasionally do like more synth review or synth demo, or when I'm setting up to like shoot a video for a course or something um, that's like showing a specific technique. I need like all that space to be able to put a big synthesizer and some effects or whatever on. So yeah, it's nice to have a, a dedicated space. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've experimented with overhead stuff in the past and it was always a little bit of a pain because uh, I know, I, I, I know people can like, you know, mount stuff to their ceiling or have like a big um, boom arm kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like I've, I've always felt like even like just getting it, like the shot set up is always such a pain and like, you know, taking it off and then coming back. It's like, now that you mention it, that may have been one of the biggest time reducers. It was just setting up that station where that was always ready to go, pretty much. Mm -hmm. You know, if I need to change out a lens or something to like my wide angle, if it's a bigger synth, I can do that very easily. But like always mm -hmm. having that camera mount up there where I could just put the camera up and it's just ready to go, it was a huge time saver because I had the yeah. same problem. And, and I tried like stuff that was actually mounted to the table. Don't ever do that. Like tip for anybody trying to do overhead stuff like anything mounted to whatever you're touching is going to shake horrendously yeah. so oh, yeah. uh, i can if i can save anyone <laughs> some <laughs> some time and pain there that would be my advice like have a dedicated stand that's not on the table or not attached to the table and, and it won't shake quite as bad sometimes it does because i'm in an attic so like if i move on the floor too much it will kind of you know but uh, it's not too bad mm -hmm. All right, the next one is uh, favorite YouTube channel or podcast or TV show at the moment? Just something you're enjoying. Probably what has helped me the most as far as podcasts in the last, I would say like six months, has been uh, The Daily Stoic, which is uh, Ryan Holiday. He's an author. He's done um, The Obstacle is the Way, lots of incredible books. I think as someone who has goals and is a, dri a driven person, I was easily and still am easily frustrated when things don't go a certain way. But like reframing everything uh, through stoicism, which is essentially, you know, it sounds like some kind of weird cult or something, but it's really not. It's very helpful, actually, and practical. It's really just like, okay, what are the things that I do control and what are the things that I don't have any control over? And I'm only going to focus on the things that I directly control. So like making the videos or making the music and that making that as good as I possibly can is the only thing that really matters because it's the only thing that I directly control the output of how that's received mm -hmm. by anyone else or how the algorithms <laughs> that we're always trying mm -hmm. to please pick that up is totally out of my control. So. I can't spend time worrying about that. It's like if there's if there's things that I can affect, then that's where I'm going to put my focus. And that's been really, really helpful, just framing things sort of through that lens. I will say also um, recently, because I like, I like video games, even though I don't have time to play them as much as I used to, uh, I've been listening to a podcast called uh, Play, Watch, Listen, which is uh, – Alana Pierce, that's, it's on her channel. It's, it's uh, Austin Wintory, who is an incredible video game composer, uh, nice. Troy Baker, and uh, Mike Bithell. And, you know, I don't even, I'm not even all that interested in game design and stuff, but that's not like solely what the podcast is about. I just love the dynamic between or among the four of them mm -hmm. and the way that they can have conversations where they don't necessarily agree on everything, but it's respectful and it comes from a place of mutual respect and they can just talk about ideas because that's such a missing thing on the internet these days. 
So I've been like shotgunning that podcast mm-hmm. <laughs> and just like listening to <laughs> it's just a fascinating and it's the kind of conversations that I have with friends, with close friends, you know, uh, where you can just you may disagree on things, but you can just talk them out, you know, and it's really nice to see that. So that's another another good one. If you're at all interested in video games or even if you aren't, it's uh, just a good good conversations there. That's cool. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Um, okay, my last question is, what goals do you have for yourself over the next few years? I think primarily, um, even though I've shifted focus to YouTube largely the last year and a half or so, uh, it really is still all about the music for me. And uh, I want that to remain the case. And that's actually, even though it seems like maybe I've directed away from that a bit, by focusing on YouTube, it's actually with that in mind because I want my music to be sort of autonomous and free of playlist culture mm-hmm. and have feeling like I have to write for a playlist. I don't ever want that to be the case. Mm-hmm. So I think being able to shift away from being dependent on streaming income or royalties or anything like that and be able to generate a sense of community and maybe through building out some more online courses that are more compositionally focused, um, be able to create some autonomy essentially and be able to support myself that is not, it's indirectly dependent on my music, but it's not directly dependent on how the music does in the algorithm machine, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think I've started to see a need or a desire where people are kind of hungry for something that's not just feeding algorithms, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and if I can kind of show that you can carve your own path um, without having to worry about that so much, I think that's what I would like to do. So yeah, just in general, kind of being able to support myself with my music indirectly, I guess you would say, like using the music as, as the proof that Maybe this guy knows a little bit of what he's talking about, and if I can can build that trust and help other people, um, I think that would be a great way to uh, to make a living. Sounds awesome, man. Well, uh, Jameson, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, and we will point people to your YouTube channel so they can check out stuff like Stop Using Only Presets, uh, Classical music, Musicians Suck at Electronic Music, Do Less Better, and uh and more uh i've really enjoyed your channel and uh, appreciate you coming on yeah it was an awesome awesome talking to you dude thanks man this has been great really really fun all right see you jameson